So, and every word that comes out of Victor's mouth, I'm telling you, will make you money. Like, literally, I'm telling you, this guy is full of knowledge. He just, the things that he says, if you just take one little tip that he says, you will make, I'm telling you, hundreds of thousands of dollars in this guy, right? He knows everything about everything. And I'm glad I actually got to know him, right? So, he's, you know, he's, I talk to him on, on, on a regular basis, and I ask him to come to the center, to come help oh, yeah. us, so, give us so, some good tips for 2020, all right? So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Am I good? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, it's hard to come up after an announcement like this. I appreciate everybody being here. I hope I can live up to uh, that kind of introduction. Uh, everybody's sort of scattered out, but I hope everybody's got something that they can take notes on. Yep. Um, Y'all don't know me, of course, but I've been a real estate investor since I was 21 years old. Uh, I've done just about every kind of real estate transaction you can do. Um, and I've been involved in um, hard money loans, I've been involved in borrowing hard money, making hard money loans, I've been involved in joint ventures, building apartment neighborhoods, the gamut of everything that can be done. And I've got, everything that I do is always about stories, and all of my stories tend to ramble and be long. So I'm just giving you a really short synopsis of some of the things that happen. And the presentation that we're doing tonight uh, Stacy wanted me to talk about um, what's the outlook for 2020. What's the market like right now in Atlanta? Is it good? Think it's good? Strong? Up? Down? Getting slow. Getting slower? Yep. Yeah, softening. I'm sorry. Softening. Softening. Uh, so what? Uh, we, but I always start with uh, since I've been doing this a long time, I've been in lots of different ups and down cycles. I always start with a disclaimer. Um, I was in, uh, I've been involved with the Knoxville Real Estate Investor Group, uh, part of National REA, uh, since uh, uh, 2012. And I put together uh, a disclaimer. And I'm Vicar Jernigan, I'm the man managing broker for GIB Incorporated, which is a real estate firm in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, Turner in the state of Tennessee. And we're in business to make a profit. We're not a nonprofit, right? Uh, Everything that we're going to talk about tonight is my opinion. It's um, for educational purposes. It's informational purposes. I don't give anybody in this room advice on how to buy or sell real estate, right? That's everybody has to think through that process. Because what I want people to always remember is that investing in real estate involves enormous risk. There, there, you can mitigate the risk, you can reduce the risk, but you can never get rid of the risk. So when you think about it, and in your investing, you always want to take time, the, the time to think about something. Never be in a hurry to buy anything. Never be in a hurry to buy a piece of real estate, an education, join the South Atlanta area, which by the way is probably the best value in the country. It's just unbelievable, the information and the, uh, the programs that Stacy puts on for everybody down here. The, but as you're thinking about investing, you want to remember that past performance, the classic line, you hear it all the time, past performance does not indicate future results. And everybody has to learn to be responsible for their own decisions. Real estate investing is one of the last, if not the last thing, that you have to take personal responsibility for. You're going to sign your name on a legal document. And the only thing that's guaranteed when you buy real estate, the only thing that's guaranteed is that you will get to spend more money. There's no way to avoid it. So the thought process here is that we've got a number of people over here that are getting started have never done a deal. Investing in real estate is the only way that I know of, the only way that I know of, in which somebody can start with absolutely nothing and create generational wealth in their lifetime. If you do it correctly. If you do it wrong, it creates generational poverty. Because the opportunities for loss are far greater than the equity you put into the transaction. Okay? So the reason I say that, I want you to take nothing as a statement of fact. I want you to take notes. Uh, if I get, I tend to get people that glazed eye look. So 
if you if I'm talking about something you don't understand or you want me to repeat, uh, then just please say that. But only you can decide when to act. So you've heard tonight, Stacy, and you've heard other people talk about uh, you've got to know your numbers, you've got to run your comps, you've got to get all your information, you've got to get your repair numbers. We'll get into all of that. But it doesn't make any difference how good your numbers were on September the 10th, 2001. It doesn't make any difference how many people said you had wonderful deals or how excited you were about the deals because the next day, everything in the world changed. Fast forward, you, you begin to rebuild after the, the, the towers came down. You begin to build back up the business. The business is really booming. And you're looking at your numbers. It's September 14, 2008. You're, you can't be more excited about the numbers. You are so happy with everything. You've got your contractors in place. You've got your money in place. Everything is really good. And the next morning, Lehman Brothers declares bankruptcy and the financial underpinnings of the United States fall away. Nobody knew on September 16th what anything in America was worth. So what happens is that I want you to begin to think in terms of how to make money with real estate. And uh, so, I, my presentation I call it the red pill of real estate. Has anybody seen The Matrix back in the day? Couple times. Get the chance to take a blue pill and a red pill. Everybody gets the red pill. Uh, if you take the blue pill, everything stays the same, right? That's all the people that aren't here tonight. The people that aren't here tonight took the blue pill. You all are going to get the red pill. Because what you've learned is not what you need to know to make money in real estate. I want to teach you how to think like an investor. Um, there's no sales pitch. I'm not selling anything at all. Um, it's completely interactive. I want to challenge the most common wisdom. We're not going to get over all of this part. I'm going to deny a part of a, about a five-hour presentation I do as a workshop for some real groups. Uh, the goal is to help beginners get started. So the people that are new that have never done a deal, I want to help you to begin to think in terms of what you need to do. And I want to help people who are more experienced, who've done a, a number of deals, to learn to make more profits in the transaction. And uh, I put this up as the, my only testimonial. Uh, this was given to me a few years ago when I was doing this presentation. All of the other gurus and experts are simply selling books, seminars, and coaches, which teaches someone how to be a better gambler. Victor, you're teaching people how to own the casino. And that really is the thought process that I want you to begin to think about. Because what we're going to talk about are what I call the myths, the truths of investing. So my grandfather used to have a saying that the that truth has a certain ring to it. And so all of these things are true, but they're not the truth. So we're going to cover comps and profits tonight. And uh, we'll get into this, but uh, everybody understand the word comps? Seriously. Somebody tell me what a, comp a, a comparable value is. Come right, on, we got to speak up. It's, it's going to be fun. I'm not going to pick on anybody, but I might pick on you. <laughs> <laughs> so, people in the back row are in a special danger. Yes? <laughs> Sales of similar, similar properties in the area? Sales of similar properties in the area. Right? Everybody good with that? Yes. And when you have comparable values, what is that? What, so, what does that value give you? It gives you an estimate of what you can get for the value of the property you're looking at. Value of the property you're looking at right now, right? Everybody good with that? Yes, sir. Profits. Um, when and how do you make a profit? When you sell. When you sell. When you buy. When you buy, right? Um, when you buy is today, and you make money in the future. Right. So we'll get into this, of uh, uh, planning, business plans and goal setting. Um, my short version of that one is, we're not going to get into it tonight, but the answer to that is no. Uh, team building, you must, have a, you must build a team. Nobody builds a team. Let me just share with you on that one. <laughs> you, you buy a team, right? Nobody builds a team, you buy a team. And the big why, passion and motivation, you've got to be passionate about what you do. Somebody want to tell me if um, uh, Auburn was more passionate than Alabama, or the Alabama football players weren't terribly passionate? Is LSU going to be more passionate than Georgia? No. 
No, but if they lose, right, they still lost. So, <laughs> so we get into all of these. I just want to focus on the top two, but I want to give you just an overview because what I talk about is different. Um, so there are five essential characteristics that every real estate investor has to have. There are only five. Uh, and if you've heard no money, no job, no credit, they're not uh, on the list. <laughs> it's possible that you can have no money, no job, no credit, and have the five characteristics. But as uh, Arthur, is it Arthur? No, yes, Arthur, as Arthur was pointing out, he's got a full-time job, and he's um, uh, obviously got a job, he's got money, he's got credit, and he's, success, he's making an effort in real estate, right? So, people who, just something to remember as you're building your career and you're gathering information. People who ask how always work for the people who ask why. Right? The difference between strategy and planning. The implementation. Systems are great, but do you think like an investor? So this is it. These are the only five things you need to have to make money in real estate. Stacy was asking earlier, what uh, is the one thing at which you're really good? The one thing at which I am really good is paying attention. I am curious about things that I see or things that I read as to how those are going to impact me. I talk to total strangers about the things upon which I'm curious to get their view or their opinion or their information. I listen to what they say. Scripts are good. I'm not saying anything about whether you should have a script or people that uh, you'll hear people talk about buying a script or we'll give you a script of what to say or we'll give you words to, to say. Uh, Stacy has a video of uh, neural linguistic programming. Oh, by the way, the um, uh, there's seven modules on the South Atlanta Rhea website. If you don't if you don't belong to South Atlanta Rhea, you need to join just to get those modules. But she talks about a term called neural linguistic programming, which is getting people to say yes. You know, you get speakers who speak, everybody hold your hand up, they agree. You get people in the habit of saying yes, right? Uh, I'm not saying that those things don't work, but I want to share with you some other ways to get transactions in the way that everybody is today. So once you listen to their answers, you have to determine, and this gets back to you being responsible for your own decisions. Because this is the opposable thumb. The, you have to determine your risk tolerance. And your risk tolerance is the amount of time you will sacrifice, right? And the capital, the money, you will put at risk in the real estate transaction. That is what separates everybody in this room. Nothing else. How much time will you sacrifice and how much money will you put at risk? to do the transaction that you found out about in the first four steps, right? You don't need to do anything else other than that. And I know this is true because these are the only five traits that I really have. <laughs> and I've been involved in hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate transactions. So we, we were asking about comps. When do real estate investors make money? We set on the buy, we set on the sell. The important thing is uh, who sets the value of your flip house or your contract when you assign it or you flip the house? Who sets the value? The buyer? Anybody else? The seller? Anybody else? The market. The market? There we go. You got somebody to get? The market. How is the sales price determined? What the, the final sale already. What the buyer and seller agree to. Yeah. If you're if you've got an assignment and you're wanting to assign your contract, which is the term wholesaling, um, anybody got a twenty dollar bill in the room? Put a, if you'll do me a favor. You got, you got a single to go along with it? I, 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 I promise I'm not going to run. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you, you, you could, for sure. So we're going to pick on, let's see, who we're going to pick on? We're going to pick on you. Okay. Close your, Marcel? Okay, Marcel. Close your ass. Put your hands, you got to put your pin down. You've been, you've been taking notes. Okay, close your eyes. Hold, hold your hand out. There you go, there's one. There's the other. Keep your eyes closed. Which, which hand's got the $20 bill in it? You're asking me? Do they feel the same? Do they feel the same? Yes. Can, do they weigh the same? Yes. This one, one's, one's worth a dollar. One piece of paper is worth a dollar. The other one is worth $20 because it has $20 written on it, right? We all accept that to be the statement of value because it has it written on it. Right. Does, does the paper weigh any different? No. Does it generally look any different? No. Nope. Just the numbers on the paper. Which one has the 20? There you go. <laughs> if it was my money, I'd let you keep it. But since it is. <laughs> well, your money is. <laughs> so, does this make, are we making sense so far or are we having too much? So what we want to do here, when real estate investors make money, and this is the one thing I want you to leave here with today. We, as real estate investors, make money in the future. Who sets the value of your flip house when you sell it? The appraiser or the lender? Right? We can say we want the market to set it, but uh, in Atlanta, uh, earlier this year and all of last year, the market was moving so fast, uh, buyers and sellers were agreeing to numbers, people were agreeing to contract assignments, and the appraisers couldn't keep up, right? Appraisals were coming in low all year long. I think the, I heard the story that something between 15 and 20 percent of all uh, sales in the Atlanta MLS had appraisal problems uh, last year in the first half of this year. Because as the market's moving up, when it comes from the past, Right? Comparable values are something which has happened in the past. What are most people told as we're growing up? If we've had a problem and it's in our past, what are we supposed to do? Forget about it. Forget about it. Never right? So what happens is, how is sales price determined? Appraisers use a program called the Uniform Mortgage Data Program. If you don't understand I know everybody's heard the phrase, start with the end in mind, you know, understand where you're going to go. But if you know what the rules of the game are, and you know what the other team's going to be required to do, aren't you smarter about playing the game than if you just go in and go blind? So if you understand what appraisers do when they appraise the property, it gets to be really important for you to be able to figure out what the appraiser is going to dictate as value. I'm involved in, uh, I, I am involved in properties getting refinanced and bought all the time, and so it's very common for me to question an appraisal that is done, and I ask for a, a reconsideration of value, because you can do that. I supply the appraiser with additional information, which they'll accept, and they'll reevaluate the appraisal. And so it's uh, very good for you all to know because sometimes you can change the value of the appraisal between 15 and on a $190,000 house, you can change the value of the appraisal between 15 and $25,000 in an upward direction just by understanding what the appraisal says. The difference between a $20 bill and a $1 bill is the numbers on the paper. The difference between an appraiser, appraisal, and the contract are the numbers on the paper, right? right? We're all talking about making money that's easy to get. So, number one, pay attention. Comps are worthless. And people say that's a crazy statement. So the market valuation, comps must have value because everyone uses them. That's, isn't that true? Everybody does it. Mom, I want to go out and play. Everybody's going. They establish the basis for purchasing and selling real estate. So they've got to be worth it. They've got to be worth everything, right? They set the parameters for lenders, all of which is true. That's true. All of these are true. They prove the value of my equity. Homeowners will tell you that all the time. The house down the street sold for that. Mine is worth this. I got so much. I got 400 more feet of shovel in my garage than they had. So 
the guru valuation. If I'm right, I'll have to look at every property before I make an offer. If you're getting started in the real estate business, if you've done 20 deals, 50 deals, or 100 deals, you want to get in the habit of looking at every single property before you buy it. Because you're the one that's committing the money to it. There's all kinds of things that can be done. There's all kinds of opportunities. There's all kinds of things now on the internet and the way contracts are being done that things can be done virtually. But all that leads to are problems and big problems if you don't know the basis of valuation. Right? I must use them to determine my after repaired value. Somebody tell me what after repaired value is? The house fixed up. Yeah. Um, Brought to like 2019 status? Brought to 2000, a house that's been remodeled and brought to 2019. So it's after the repairs are done, right? Right. That is the most worthless term you will ever hear. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. The most worthless term. And we'll get into the reasons why, because that only applies, after repair value only applies to a lender who's creating a loan for you to do the remodeling of the house. <laughs> the, that's the only time that it applies. Every other time, it's completely worth this in conversation, and we'll get into the reasons why. They, and then when I love, comps prove that I've made money when I buy a distressed property. I have seen houses that have had inspections, and there's been 50 people go through that house. They're all written down there, you know, on the inspection sheet, we were in the house, right? Every realtor has drugged their client as a home buyer to see it because it's priced at some low value and maybe it'll work for their client and they can't find anything else for the buyer, right? But somehow, after it's been shown a hundred times by realtors and fifty times to investors, in somebody's mind, they've got a comparable value that says, this house is a hell of a buy and I'm going to buy it and I'm going to make a lot of money on it because this is how I'm going to get the house repaired. You see that on bigger pockets a lot. If anybody's not on, if anybody here on bigger pockets, the websites. So you'll see those kind of comments all the time on bigger pockets. I've got this house, I got it for sale. It's worth this because this is my estimate of repairs. Appraisal is an opinion of value. Go to this website, appraisalinstitute.org. It is the Bible of the Appraisal Institute, and you can, there'll be white papers that are referenced. You can, um, there's all kinds of articles now that are written by the Appraisal Institute that talk about does an Airbnb unit, how do I value an Airbnb unit as part of this house, right? Is it an addition to the house or is it a detraction from the house? There's all kinds of um, uh, articles uh, that you can Google on uh, how to value a granny flat, how to an accessory dwelling unit. And, and so the people who are part of the Appraisal Institute are always giving the opinions that become the value of the property. If you want to learn how the business runs, read how the people who run the business say it should be running. Right? If you want to get smarter about buying, see how they set the value of the property. Am I, am I lecturing too much? So, Sean Terry, uh, anybody read, seen uh, Sean Terry's videos in here? Okay, Sean Terry has uh, 33,000 YouTube subscribers, and he's got one video on how to go from zero to 10 deals a month. That's uh, had thousands and thousands and thousands of views. Sean Terry is um, a really well-known uh, person and is flipped to Freedom Academy and teaching people how to flip houses. And so what he does in the video is the absolute first thing you have to do is get leads. So when I told everybody at the beginning that I disagree with most everything that's being said, you'll see this real, it's coming real true right here. <laughs> absolute first, this guy's got 33,000 subscribers. The first thing you have to do is get leads. Distressed sellers only. You don't want to deal with people who just want to sell their property. You only, can, you only have to do business, you can't do business, he says that in the video. Don't waste your time doing business with people who just want to sell, right? So everybody should go to the video. It's really easy. It's about an hour and a half long. How to go from zero to 10 deals a month. You should watch it. Because in the video, 
He's telling the whole world how to do exactly the same thing, right? Everybody that's watching it. And what's the thing that separates everybody in this room? Taking action. Action takers. Action takers is important, but you've got to be able to determine risk and time, right? How much time you time you will sacrifice and money you will put at risk, right? Taking action occurs after you've done that. If you take action, you know, that thing, whole thing about uh, uh, aim, fire, shoot, right? <laughs> so you got to, let's, let's get in the thought process of understanding how you're going to evaluate a transaction based on information that creates value. That's what we want to talk about. So he talks about direct mail as the number one lead generation. So you got to get leads, and so the next thing is, you can only deal with distressed sellers, and so the next thing is direct mail. You're going to buy a list, you're going to buy a list, that's anybody in the country can buy if they got it for the same amount of money as you got. You, you buy a tracking phone number that goes with that list, and so you buy that tracking phone number, and he tells you how to do that. And you buy form letters to mail out, because everybody's going to be mailing out form letters, and you're going to be sending out the form letters. And how many does he say you should plan to send out? 10,000 letters. Is there any part of that going from zero to 10 deals a month that talks about understanding how value is created in real estate? No. He wants you to commit to a specific day to get a deal. So you're going to commit to do something that you don't understand how value is created, right? And you're going to commit to a specific date, and you're going to be mailing letters, and you're going to be talking to people who may call you up, and you don't have any way to really evaluate their deal, their offer, their opportunity, other than if they're really distressed, or uh, you've got a situation where you're evaluating the comps, and you could be able to get a comparable value of something that happened 90 days ago, six months ago, nine months ago, near their house. So Sean Terry's goal is to teach you how to do, do business with distressed people, spend a bunch of money, get leads that you don't know how to handle, commit, commit to do something you don't know how to do, and on the average, you, and this is the one I love, and, and so you're going to learn to buy a property, you're going to learn to make offers by taking your opinion of the three lowest comps and average, averaging those numbers, and that's what you're going to offer. But when you get ready to sell, you're going to sell on your opinion of the three highest comps. Now, an appraisal is an opinion of value, but is it your opinion of value? No. Am I making sense? Am I rambling? If I get off track. So what happens is, and this guy's got 33,000 subscribers. I'm Victor Jernigan. I've got zero. <laughs> uh, I've, I've put together a program back some years ago called uh, How to Make Folding Money. You know what folding money is? Folding money is um, dollar bills. And, for, and what I use is, um, this is um, a Mr. Clip money clip. And you can take 40 $100 bills, fold them over, and they fit in a Mr. Clip money clip. And that's, so folding money is stuff you can put in your pocket. It's not going to change your life. It's $500, it's $1,000. It's how to gather information and sell information and pick up folding money because it begins to make your life easier. And I'm going to show you how to pick up folding money by just paying attention. Okay? If I get preach, you tell me. I told Stacy she, if I get rambling too much, she's got to call me in. So what? So we're going to buy on this. So I strongly disagree with getting leads. You've got to have market knowledge. Market knowledge is the number one thing you need to have, and we'll talk about the reasons why. Okay. You need contracts to assign. You got to do business with people who want to sell their property because you know, with market knowledge, what the property is going to be worth in the future. Do we care what it's worth today? Do we care what it was worth six months ago or nine months ago under some other condition, right? No. So, he wants you to uh, buy lists. And what sets you apart from everyone else who's buying the same list? 
You're marketing the free foreclosures. You're marketing only the stressed people. Free foreclosures, tax default, absentee owners. I'm not saying that that doesn't work, right? I'm saying that I want people who really want to make money in real estate, long-term wealth, to understand the mechanics of how the real estate business works and to think like an investor. So, if you're all, if you're all buying the same list and you're all marketing to the same list, right? Some people get 20, 30 letters a day in some markets. And the thing now is ringless voicemails. Um, in Atlanta, it's hard to use ringless voicemails because there's so many people using ringless voicemail down here that um, your call just gets lost in the mess, right? So um, ringless text messages and ringless voicemails are things that people are doing a lot of now. They, uh, but today, the Senate, they, they, they're getting ready to send the bill to Trump to change the law on how all ringless voicemails work in the United States. It just signed, I heard it on the radio, I'm grabbing over here. Uh, 417 to 3. At least everybody in Congress can agree on that. Nobody likes to get voicemails, ringless voicemails. Nobody likes to get uh, random phone calls. So uh, if you don't, this is the critical point right here. Oh, maybe, uh, uh, if you don't know what your time is worth or why property is worth your contract price, what good is your commitment? So there's no reason to commit to a specific date to get a deal if you don't know what your time is worth, what the property is worth, or your contract, the value of your contract. If anyone, if anyone can pick their comps, they have no meaning or value. Comps are dangerous and probably worthless to most investors. <coughs> Problems for comps with the market valuation. Comps are purely historical. They rely on input by the tax appraiser and realtors for square footage. Do realtors make mistakes when they take the square footage of a home? Right? All the time. So where do comps come from? Where do the, where do the appraisers who set the value get their comps? I'm sorry, public records, tax records. Prop I'm sorry? Prop Street. Prop Street. Prop, prop that's, well, that's a website, that's a good one. That's not what the appraisers use. <laughs> the appraisers use the multiple listing service of the market that they're in. So they have the uniform data program. You, t you type in the address of the property, right? And it pulls up all the properties that have sold. You set the parameters of where, of how, where you want the comps to come from on the program. It's a mapping program, and you pull it up, and it pulls up all of the closed transactions that have gone through the MLS within whatever the uh, appraiser has defined as the geography that they're searching for. The multiple listing service. Comps do not have to be in the same school zone. I've got a property right now. I just sent it back to reconsider of evaluation. There's a road going. And you'll hear the same story over and over again. My house is, in this, is on this side of the road in a small neighborhood. Little, it was built back in the 70s. And uh, let me just get this right. It was built in the 80s. And the big neighborhood that surrounds it was built in the 70s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Big neighborhood, 600 houses. And all the houses here, it's the number one elementary school district in East Tennessee. It's the number one middle school district in East Tennessee, right? And these people that live here are really protective of that elementary school and that middle school, right? My house that I've got is in that neighborhood, that school zone. It's not in that neighborhood, but it's in that school zone. Across the street, literally across the street, the people on that side go to school seven miles in that direction, and uh, they're good schools. All the schools in Oxford are good schools. But this one is nowhere near the, it, on a ranking of people's perception. It's not as good as West Hills. And so I want the comp to come, I want the appraiser to pull the comps from the West Hills school system. Because people will pay a 10 or 20% premium to get into West Hills. Does that make sense? Appraisers are just pulling off a geographic circle. 
If you understand what you're looking for, if you understand what you're asking for, they will reconsider what they've done. And if you're asking for something reasonable, they will go back and re-examine their data. Because most of the information comes from the MLS, comps impute a 6% commission. This is what, <laughs> how many people knew that? All comps include a 6% real estate commission. I'm just using 6%, there you go, somebody. So the reason is that I'm just using 6% because that's the traditional average number across the, the, in the United States. You know, a couple of years from now, it might be 4%. But because the comps are coming from closed transactions in the MLS, all realtors are charging a commission. So if you use a comp, you're automatically including a fee for somebody that's not existing in the transaction, right? Does that make sense? Why would you want to include a 6% fee that you want to earn? Most people never explain that or share that information with the seller of property. So regardless of the subject, um, so think of, and always think in terms of, you want to understand how comps are generated, how comps are created, and how they're used, because they're used by the appraisers who are determining the value of your property. Comps are not required to describe the quality of finish differences. Quality of finish, um, appraisers will generally comment on the um, how the home has been updated, whether it's in uh, good condition, bad condition, whether it's generally been updated. It's a category called condition one, two, three, four, five. About 80% of all homes qualify for condition three, which is average to a slightly above average condition. Uh, two is uh, semi-custom build, and condition one is a custom built home. Four and five, obviously your homes would have problems, right? So if you begin to understand that, you begin to see how the money's put together. So look at everything, recognize and understand, but do not rely on cost. They give you a starting point. I, I, I've got a really good friend uh, in Knoxville who owns the largest real estate firm in the state of Tennessee. He's the 60th largest firm in the country. So he's a and we're really good friends. And so we talk about this particular issue all the time because they deal, real estate agents have to have comps. They're doing listing presentations. They're doing, they're helping people with buying property. They're handling buyers and talking about what the comps say they should be paying for a piece of property, right? And I'm saying that they're worthless. And what we do agree on is that they do create a sort of a starting platform that everybody can use. We as investors, it gives us a map as to how the other people are looking at property. We don't really care how they're looking at property. We care how we're looking at property because it's our money and our time, right? So, uh, every, so they give you a starting point, but that's all they are. Every investor must value the cost of their money plus a risk premium. The actual economic term is uh, opportunity cost. But we're going to we can get into all kinds of that. But you need to know that you're going to be investing money and you want a rate of return on your money. But we'll get it, that's, a, that's a long topic by itself on how do you understand how to run your own business as an employee of your own company. But every investor must determine their time horizon for their investment of time and money. If you're doing a flip, if you're going to be assigning a contract, you're going to take a piece of paper and you're going to, this person's going to sign it and you're gonna sell it here, right? Then is it gonna take you 24 hours? Is it gonna take you three months? You gotta understand what, how, what period of time can you control with the contract, the property, so that you can sell your contract to someone else who will pay you for it. So once you determine your time horizon, then you can begin to put all of the other things together. Because if you understand what your time is worth, and you understand how much money you're willing to sacrifice, you're setting a clock on yourself as to when you're going to be able to get it done. That's a goal you can commit to, right? So you've got to understand the value of your time above all other things. If comps do not determine value, I must buy love. Maximum allowable offer. Could somebody give me the definition of maximum? Who's brave enough now to give me the definition? <laughs> <laughs> and the 
What is uh, the formula? Seventy percent times the ARV. Seventy percent of the ARV. Yeah, minus a uh, minus the rehab cost. And if you wholesale, and then you gonna also subtract the wholesale fee. Minus the ten thousand. If that's what your wholesale fee is. <laughs> <laughs> so you take the average repaired value. What have I said about average repaired value? Or it's not really a very good term for you all. You're going to take that number, that mythical number that's out there. Look over here, here's the shiny object. You're going to take this mythical number that you've made up, because that's your number that you've made up. And you're going to subtract 30% uh, of that. So you're using 70% of that mythical number. And then you're going to subtract your repair costs, because you've used those repair costs to get to that mythical number. And you're going to subtract the wholesaling fee, and you're going to offer that person that property, or to buy that property. Now, I am 100% certain that you can always buy a property cheaper. There's always, you'll, you'll always find opportunities to do that. <coughs> what I want people to understand is that that formula works by accident. It doesn't work with intention. And the reason it doesn't work with intention is if you call me up with your repair value, what does that mean to me? <laughs> right? If you call somebody up who's going to stroke a check for a couple of hundred thousand dollars to buy a house, let's just use, let's, use, let's say you got a property under contract for 60000 you want to sell your contract for 90000 um, and you've got a, your estimate of repairs is $10,000, uh, and so you're, you're telling the guy he's going to be all in for 100000 and he's going to be able to sell it for $135,000, go ahead and write me the check for a hundred. So let's think through that for a second. You're selling, the con you're selling your contract to somebody who knows what they're doing because they have accumulated the ability to stroke a check for $100,000. Why would they take your opinion of what the repairs are worth? They've got their own subs, they know what they're doing. If they don't have their own subs and they don't know what they're doing, then you need to be sure to keep them quiet and use them again because they're not going to have much money long. So, yes? What's a sub? A sub is the subcontractor, the contractor who's going to be actually doing the work, doing the repairs. Oh, so if, if when you buy a house to remodel, if you're going to do the work yourself, the term is you're wearing a tool belt. You're on the job doing the repairs yourself. And in most situations in the South, um, on repairs that are under thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars, labor is about sixty percent, fifty to sixty percent minimum of the project. Could be seventy percent. So under thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars, materials only run ten or fifteen thousand dollars of that project. The rest of it's labor and managing the labor and getting it done. So uh, if we're so, there's a lot of information that a lot of people are taught to learn about repairs, learn about getting repairs done. Learn about getting, you don't need to know any of this stuff. You don't need to know any of it. Investors make money by monetizing information. Let's go through that again. Investors make money by monetizing information. So, we're gonna go strong curiosity. I've got a slide on this, but Investing in real estate, so let's look at the difference. Investors monetize information. Investing in real estate is somebody's touching the real estate and they are using systems to create value, right? So investors are strictly information-based. Investing is you're acquiring the property and you're using some system. You're a better plumber than somebody else. And I think I have a slide on that. Does anybody keep track of the time? I'm not... Um... I have a question. What, are we good? What time is it? About eight fifteen. Yes. Okay. So I know you're probably going to get that, but I just want to be clear. Are you saying that the uh, knowing the uh, how much it's going to cost to rehab it is not important? <laughs> not important. And the reason it's not you need to you need to have an idea of what it takes to rehab, right? You, you do. So, but you don't need to be an expert in rehab. So, for example, what I would say, if you're new in the business, find uh, uh, a home inspection company that's doing a lot of home inspections, 
pay the home inspector $150 to tag along with him on an inspection, right? Watch what he does. Don't get in his way because they really move fast. But if you pay the home inspector to tag along with them, and the home inspectors, they have no reason to not let you tag along, right? Some, I've never had one to say no. So uh, there may be one that does that now. But it's certainly the quickest way to learn what's wrong with the house. You don't need to be real confused about the total numbers because it's not meaningful. Because I might think that the house needs a new roof because the roof is 12 years old. You would say that that roof, the house, that roof is still good. It doesn't need a new roof, right? Two different opinions of value involving thousands and thousands of dollars. What you need to understand is that roof is 12 years old, right? That's all you need to know. I, I'm trying, I want people to see that there is a simpler way to make money in real estate if you understand the fundamentals. Now, remember at the beginning of the presentation, I said this is the red pill of real estate? Huh? Is it being true so far? So, why should anyone buy your deal, your contract, your assignment? James Rouse uh, is one of the most prolific real estate developers in the history of the United States, and certainly in the 20th century. Uh, he invented something called the mall. He built, he built Columbia, Maryland, right? So he is the person who got... Uh, uh, Johnson, he was the person that Johnson went to when they created the Fair Housing Act to help write the Fair Housing Act. <coughs> this is a really smart guy. Profit is not the legitimate purpose of the business, not how much money we're going to make. The legitimate purpose of a business is to provide a product or service to people that need it, and we do it so well that they're happy to pay us. If I had to tell my daughter that I made money by doing business with desperate people. People who were in a distressed situation and I was taking, and whatever amount of money I was making, I was making because those people needed to hurry up and make a decision. I mean, seriously. You don't win championships by playing the weakest teams. You win championships by learning how to win you're looking for the toughest competition, not the least competition. Investor profits are created by the monetization of information. I know something you don't know. Investing profits are earned by better systems. So if you have market knowledge, you know what's going on, you have control of the property, of that information, that property for a specific period of time, that gives you the opportunity to create profit. Market knowledge plus time plus systems consistently generate profits, transaction after transaction, year after year. It's the combination of the three that really makes you money on a long-term basis in real estate. My favorite quote, in real estate, this is from Donald Rumsfeld, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and the one that costs everybody all their money? The unknown unknowns. When you get into remodeling houses, that's the one that gets everybody screwed up. The unknown unknowns. The contract was signed on September the 10th, 2001. The contract was signed on September the 14th, 2008. You don't know Lehman Brothers is going to go broke the next day. The unknown unknowns are the one that costs us all our money. For the people who are getting started, you have to determine what your competitive advantage is going to be. Because if you're sending out hundreds of form letters, 10,000 form letters that everybody else is sending out, what the hell is your competitive advantage? I mean, seriously, all you're doing is spending money that everybody else is spending, and you're hoping somebody that's really desperate is going to get your letter next, and they're going to call you up and say, please come by my house? I mean, come on. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Believe me, I know it does happen. People make a lot of money doing business like that. I'm wanting people to understand to make some real value over an extended period of time. Right? What makes your maximum allowable offer better than others? Why would anyone pay you a profit? So, 
Um, I've got a projection of neighborhood value that I put together. Uh, back some, I've been using it for decades. But um, how, do, how do most people tell you to rank a neighborhood? Anybody speak up? If you're looking at a neighborhood and you're looking at houses, they're telling you to go to a neighborhood and get on Craigslist and look for the worst house in the neighborhood, tall grass, uh, shrubs that haven't been trimmed, um, right? Mm -hmm. Houses that uh, haven't been cleaned, gutters that are dirty, right? Yeah. That's what you're telling me, right? That's right. Tarps. I'm sorry? Tarps. Tarps. Tarps on roofs. There's a good one. Um, so sometimes you'll see where the people are ranking neighborhoods. Go to, you know, don't worry about an A neighborhood because that's going to be too expensive to get in. What you're looking for is a, a C plus or a B minus neighborhood where everybody goes to work, right? Uh, it's, everybody's leaving at about the same time every morning and you're looking for that, or you will classify it as a working class neighborhood or a blue collar neighborhood. Um, you want to, don't want to buy in affluent neighborhoods because there's too much risk, because the houses are too expensive. Don't buy in poor neighborhoods because they might turn into war zones. What does that tell you? Mm -hmm. Does that tell you anything about the future? Does that tell you anything about what the property is really worth? <coughs> no, that doesn't. So I put together something really simple. Uh, it's, it's 12, I, it's, there are 12 points. The first three are up here. And it's what I call immediate demand. If you want to make money, you want to know where to go? Okay. Number one. Can somebody read that up there? Greater than 40,000 square feet. Why 40,000 square feet? The amount of people that can hold. I'm sorry? The amount of people the grocery store can hold. That's moving in the right direction. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh meat. It's the smallest size of a Publix, smallest size of a Whole Foods. So they don't have Kroger anymore. It's, I think Sprouts are 40,000 square feet. Aldi, everybody, everybody know Aldi down here now? They've been there for a couple years now. I love Aldi. <laughs> so, all, uh, all these 28,000 square feet. Right? So, what, this is a scoring system. Two points for uh, each store, two to three miles. Three points for one to two miles. Four points if you've got a store within a mile. Five points for each additional store within one mile. And this gets to be really important. Five point, uh, minus five points if there are no stores within three miles. If there's not a grocery store within three miles of the property you're looking to purchase, what is that neighborhood called? Food Desert. Three miles. If there's no grocery store within three miles, it's a food desert. Who wants to move into a food desert? We're going to be selling our houses when? In the future. We want to sell in neighborhoods that we know have demand. Whether we're going to be selling to someone who's going to be, we've done the remodel and we're going to be reselling at retail or close to retail, or we're wanting to assign our contract. We're wanting to have something where we know there's going to be demand. The number one criteria of demand in the United States is a grocery store with a 40,000 square foot grocery store within a mile of the house. Why is that? Why, why do we want grocery stores close to home? Okay, okay here's a tough question. Sorry? Fresh food. Fresh food. Who does most of the shopping? Me. The ladies. The wives. Right? Just the way it works out. What, uh, so it used to be wives were staying home, and so grocery stores were convenient. But now they don't have any time because wives are also working. So if you've got kids and or parents that are staying with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I have a question yep. about in the future. Yes. I'm seeing going back to the future. I'm seeing home delivery. First we saw them where they had a dedicated to go pick up at the Kroger and look Right. Around. Now I'm seeing People have it delivered to my house. So this, we're going to get into that very topic because I'm, so I, my uh, sister-in-law just did that the other day. On Sunday night, she was ordering all this, all these groceries from the lap from her kitchen, right? Um, so that she could get it delivered before nine o'clock, so there'd be food in the house on um, uh, Monday morning. 
So to, to that point exactly. But as far as we are going to be concerned for the next 10 years, food delivery is something which is going to increase in participation. But as far as we are concerned, the number one determinant of value is to not be in a food desert, right? If, you're, if you look at property, and, you, and we'll get into this, but if you look at a property and the, um, there's an announcement that there's going to be a grocery store built, right? The area is no longer going to be a food desert. You've read, and we're going to look at this. There's a, you all got to hand that, we'll get into it. But most of the time, the grocery stores will give you the address of where they're going to purchase property and where they're going to build. So it winds up that you can know where they're going to be in the if there is no grocery store within three miles, a grocery store adds about 20% in value to every house in the three mile ring. It depends on where you are in that three mile ring, right? Whether you're one mile away or three miles away, but if you're just picking a number straight across the board, it's 20% value. 20%? 20%. That's how you make money with information. I got a question. Yes. What about uh, hospitals and stuff? I heard that helps too, right? So uh, right off the chart right here is uh, questions four through six are neighborhood stability, and seven through 12 deal with long-term opportunity. So for, for the meeting down here tonight, I'm just talking about the first three um, questions on my on my little list, right? So. But I will say, hospitals is on the list. So the next thing you're looking for is a super Walmart. And what's it say out there besides the super Walmart? Why? Why do you want a super Walmart less than seven years old? They'll be open for at least 10 more years. Walmart will not close a store. I don't think they've ever closed a store that's um, younger than 17 years old. So they're going to, they would prefer to expand where they are, but sometimes they have to close and relocate a few miles away. But if you're looking for a super Walmart, why are you looking for a super Walmart? Groceries. Groceries. Fresh, Groceries. Fresh meat, vegetables. It, exactly. So you wind up with a situation that Walmart sometimes is the first market. You go into some of the more rural, rural areas, Walmart will be the first real retail store that's there. There's not a second grocery. Right. Right? Where well, you really start to make money is when that second grocer opens up. That's when, that that's when you know that neighborhood's moving, right? The third is uh, major re retail, not Walmart shadow space. And what I mean by that is not Hibbit, you know, you got a Walmart super center, and then over on the side, you got some different retail shop, Hibbit Sports, and all of those people. You don't count any of those people. You're looking for major other retail that is in people's life patterns, um, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, something like that. And the reason is, that the commercial nodes are making it more convenient. And they're showing up because the people that live in the area are more affluent. They've got more money. And they have less time. So those three categories, I just, um, those three right there, I call immediate demand. And if you take those to heart and you begin to work backwards from real estate transactions, you'll begin to see how to make money with this information. So, here's how it works in real life. I did a presentation in uh, Nashville, uh, and so Hearth, somebody, some, one of the people in the room had an address, 221 Hearthstone Circle. So I put down their uh, address, which is up here in the corner, and I just, you do this on Google Earth, just right click the button, and down at the bottom, it's got measure, right? Click on the map and measure, shows it for you. And so you drive, just draw a line down there's the school. So you pass over an elementary school, there's a middle school, there's a Walgreens and a Publix, all within a half mile of the property. How much demand is there for that neighborhood? Right? You get something in that neighborhood, it's gone instantly, right? You get something in that neighborhood, somebody will pay you a premium for it because somebody else will pay them a premium to get it. All right, be fair. Yes. They don't know what Franklin, Tennessee is. Oh, I'm sorry. Nashville. No, Nashville oh. is different. <laughs> in Williamson, I used to live there. Yeah. That is, there's 
I'm trying to think of uh, an area here. Johns Creek would be Walmart compared to, you know, New York City. Franklin, Tennessee is destroyed tonight. It is in very high demand. Extremely yeah. high demand. Yeah, that's where the rich rich go. And so, um, so this, that particular house um, was 200, uh, at the value of the time I did this presentation, was about 250, $260,000. It's about 300,000 a day. Uh, so right here, um, the same, the same markers, right? So down here, we come on down, the Kroger is two and a half miles, or two and a quarter miles, the high school is two miles, and there's a private school in between. And I use the three mile, three mile mark on that neighborhood back there because everything's clustered along the interstate. And you can just do this with Google Earth. It doesn't take any effort. You pull up the address, right click on the map, the menu comes up, go to measure, and the three mile line is the big arc right there. And Whole Foods and the Super Walmart are at I-65. They're 3.2 3 to 4 miles away. Right? So you've got a Publix interior to the, to the neighborhood, high demand grocery store, right? More affluent shoppers in general. Kroger for the masses, right? Does this make sense? So I don't know anything about Atlanta, but I want to make money in Atlanta. So I type in Google search, new grocery store plan in Atlanta. Now, you would think everybody in this room would do that. But what, yeah. Can you look at future Walmart coming out? Is there like a place to go, like it's like a rural area? No, you can't. Walmart doesn't announce where they're going to specifically be building stores, but you can. You go to what? It's, it's part of this longer presentation. Uh, you go to a planning meeting, yeah. the local planning authority, and, and pe people who are doing Walmart shopping centers, they create a lot of uh, issues. So we'll show you how to back into that information. But in Atlanta, you would go to the uh, Atlanta planning the Metropolitan Planning Association of Atlanta. I don't know what the specific name of the governmental body here is, but if you just type in, I'll show you in a minute, zoning fights, you'll, you'll, you'll find out. So I typed in grocery stores, and it, it comes up with a list of information. And um, so Lidl, L-I-D-L, ramping up expansion in Metro Atlanta, that was in 2000, uh, that was earlier this year, 2019, 2019. There's one in 2017, June of 2017. Lidl, a giant grocery store chain, launches in Georgia. In 2016, February, a year, you know, 14 months earlier, discount chain Aldi has expanded to close to 20 in the last five years and is going to do another 20 stores. So in 2016, if you have this information, you can go to Aldi's website, right, and they show you where, they're going to store, where the stores are going to be built where the plan locations were in 2016. How much money could you have made from 2016 to now if you've been taking action in 2016 with that one little piece of public information? Lidl, a direct competitor to Aldi, Aldi only goes where they have real competition. Aldi is the, one of those competitors that I, they want you to walk out the front door of an Aldi, and they want you to see a Super Kroger right there, and they want you to see a Super Walmart right there. I call them the slot machine of grocery stores. They're backed up against the wall, taking on all comers. <laughs> right? And they make a profit every year. That's strength. That's real strength. That's not distressed, desperate people. I hate that term. So grocery stores, so we look right down here, how about this for search? I don't know anything about Atlanta. 11, 12, oh gosh, that's three weeks ago? 2019. Yeah. Summer Hill, Atlanta, Carter Grocery Store getting built. New grocery store, restaurant, bike lane. So I just typed in, you read that article, it gives you the street, uh, Georgia Avenue, Summer Hill, Georgia. Anybody know where that is? Yeah. They're about to get an all new grocery store and bike lanes. And we're gonna talk about why that's important. But I would go there, if I don't know anything about anything, I'm going to go there and I'm going to look at that development and I'm going to look at those neighborhoods that are there. 
And I want to begin to find the property that I'm wanting to look, I don't ever look, I mean, if you're in the business, you automatically, you, by nature, you see the houses with grown up grass. You just, because it's something ingrained, you're just, you've done it for so many years, you're just looking at it. And what you really want to look for in a neighborhood, right, is somebody who's just done a two, put up a $2,000 garage door. Oh. You want to look for the person, that you want to look for that yard, right, that they've got that $3,000 play set in the backyard. You know, the, the wood ones with uh, the trampolines and swings and slides and everything on the little board on one end. Because those people have bought those houses and they've remodeled those houses and they're living in those houses. They're not reselling those houses. Those people who buy $2,000 garage doors and $3,000 play sets have got friends who are going to come and visit them, have a cookout, and they're going to look around and say, man, you got a real buy on this house. I need to be living in this neighborhood. And they're going to want to buy something that's in that neighborhood because they can see what a great housing value their, their friends have. And so they're going to look for something to buy, and they're not going to sell it either. So there, are there any comps on the resales? Is there real demand for people to move into that neighborhood? Yeah. If you find a house that's got grown up grass and an absentee owner, I guarantee you that person who owns that house does not know what's going on in their neighborhood. And that these, the people with more money are moving in and beginning to uh, rebuild the houses. Right. Right? So the first, that, that's a buying opportunity. That house deserves a lot of focus because the neighbors would like to see that house bought. They'll even give you somebody to sell it to. So look for where the opportunity is changed and it's going to be in the future that you're making money. Everybody understand Summer Hill? New grocery stores planned in Atlanta. So this goes back to yours right here. Zoning controversy in Franklin, Tennessee. I'm telling you how to make money with this. I'm not selling you anything. Everything I'm talking to you about, everybody in this room can do. It doesn't cost you a dime. It costs you internet connection because you've got to have Google, right? You've got to have pencil and paper to write stuff down on. So, zoning, Z-O-N-I-N-G, zoning, you can put up zoning fights, zoning controversy, okay. uh, either one, uh, as a search. So I piped in zoning controversy in Franklin, Tennessee. And it pulls up neighborhoods, neighbors opposed Franklin development, and it talks about a controversial development in the Williamson County Farm is one step closer to getting done. Um, been three years getting zoned. Three years getting this be zoned. The reason that that's important, it's bringing sewer. If you read the article, the neighbors don't want it because it's bringing sewer and it's going to cause for more development to occur. So, if there's not sewer today, but there's going to be sewer tomorrow, what happens to the property? It goes up in value. Right? So if you're paying attention and you're just reading what's happening in the paper, everywhere we drive, Every road we drive on, every place we eat, every place we shop has been made by somebody else's political decision. We didn't make the decision to put those restaurants there. We didn't make the decision to build those houses there. We didn't make the decision to build those apartments there. But we live in those houses, we live in those apartments, we eat those restaurants, right? So all I'm wanting you to do is pay attention as things are beginning to move forward because these are all things which have to have uh, public approval to get done, right? When um, Aldi is announcing an expansion, it's because they are putting everybody on point. There's going to be more of us. In the, there's going to be more Aldis in this town. We really like uh, this town. And for people that are paying attention, you go buy where they're going to buy. The um, Stevens, but this is a great one right here on just listening and public information. Stevens Valley Developer, uh, uh, and again, I just pulled this off the internet. Stevens Valley Developer yanks $1.2 million offer for Franklin Schools. So this guy was willing to give, we've all heard uh, a quid pro quo lately, haven't we? Uh, in the news. Every zoning meeting, you can watch in the city zonings in Atlanta, all the local communities. If you, They're all public, they're all available to watch on. Uh, closed circuit on the community TV channels. They're all public. They're either on the commission websites or the county, city council websites. So they're all there to watch. 
So, but every meeting is quid pro quo. The property owner wants to sell their property for the most money. The developer's trying to come in and pay them the most money. To pay them the most money, the developer needs these things from the government to allow it to be done. So many houses per acre, so units per acre, building units per acre to be built. They need certain kind of road infrastructure. They need something. So this developer is offering $1.2 million to the school system. And to this gentleman's point, Franklin uh, said, well, you know, we, uh, I think there might be a lot of money somewhere, but that's not a lot of money to Franklin uh, County School System. So they said, no. So he, he, so he said, you didn't fire me, I quit. So he pulled, he, he, went, he didn't have the vote, so he pulled the money. And that's all in that article. But what happened is, the school district tweeted Friday that developer John Richard withdrew his offer uh, to the school district to help pay for uh, Franklin High School improvements. He had asked that in exchange for the donation, the district promised quid pro quo, the, uh, for the donation, the district promised to zone the plant subdivision for Grassland Elementary. Can you imagine? He wants to be in the best elementary school, Grassland Elementary, Grassland Middle, and Franklin High School. I don't know anything about anything, but I want to go to Franklin, Tennessee. I want to be an investor. I want to buy something. Right there is where I'm going. I'm going to find out where the Grassland Elementary School District is. Because this guy offered $1.2 million to help that high school, and they said, hell no, we don't want that money. And he was only offering the money if he could get into those school districts. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. You can do that everywhere in the United States. Read the article, see what it says, and then pay attention to how it will impact your investments. Right? Anybody bored yet? Yes. Okay. You blowing my mind, first of all. <laughs> um, maybe I'm drunk off YouTube videos and everything, but I'm just trying to figure out the difference, like what you're saying about the stress property owners and going into the hood, if you will, right. looking for vacant property versus looking for what's you know, developing. So, so do I drive for dollars in those areas? So what happens? What happens is what I suggest is that you begin to pick with certainty where you want to drive for dollars, where you want to invest your time, right? Where you want to invest your money. <laughs> buying in the hood is um, a, a term that people will call buying in war zones, cash flow opportunities. You're gonna buy a house for $60,000, you're gonna put $10,000 in it, you're gonna put a KCDC, a, a, a Section 8 tenant in there for $1,000 a month, right? And that, you're gonna keep that Section 8 tenant in there and you're gonna make three or $400 a month cash flow. The problem is that if you continue to own that home, the only other buyer for that home is another investor. There's no occupier, there's no homeowner buying that home, right? So the only person you've got to sell to is another investor. The only exit strategy is you have to sell for something close to what you bought it for and you own it, you've got to do the repairs, you may be getting some cash flow out of it, right? But you're going to have to dispose of it and you're going to have to be doing the repairs in the intervening period of time. What I suggest is if you look at an area that, where you can see where there's a new grocery store getting planned to go or a super Walmart, there's a big zoning controversy for a super Walmart. So what you want to do is look at like here, for example, we know Grassland Elementary, Grassland Middle, and Franklin High School are really high dollar areas, right? Well, you can go on uh, Google and Bing, and uh, there's a ranking of every school in the state of Tennessee, state of Georgia, every school in America is ranked, right? And so you can use the ranking of Grassland to compare to the ranking of some other school. Because one of the things that stops, that changes a hood from being a hood, is when you see some 30 year olds out there putting up signs in an older neighborhood that say, homeowners meeting Monday night at 7.30. Because there hasn't been involved neighbors before. It's an old neighborhood, you know, a lot of rental properties in the neighborhood maybe. But now you got people that are buying those $2,000 garage doors that are moving in and they want to have restrictions. Restrictions make us money. Right? Wow. I'm sorry? I just said, wow. <laughs> yes? How does the, um, the new Airbnb craze change that dynamic? So Airbnb, so that's a function of every community that you're going to be investing in because every community has a different standard for Airbnb. In Knoxville, you have to live in the property 
have an Airbnb unit. So you can't own it, you can't be an absentee Airbnb owner in Knoxville, Tennessee. In Nashville, you can't be in the national city limits, right? So every community's got their own standards about Airbnb, and you have to be really careful when you invest in Airbnb, and you should definitely Google before you buy an Airbnb, go to the appraisal institute, look at uh, how, how, how does uh, Airbnb impact the value of my property, right? Another website everybody should have down, there's two free, two great websites. Uh, the first is Investopedia. Oh, yeah. In Investopedia. Spelled exactly like it sounds. It's a free website. It's got, every, it's got the definition and the explanation of every financial term you'd ever want to see. And the other one is a website, and y'all may be on this one already, Khan Academy. Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you're not on Khan Academy, uh, you definitely need to get on Khan Academy. Uh, it's one of the best educational tools around uh, for students and kids in school, parents, adults, but it talks about so many things that we run into and shares the information in a way that everybody can understand it, whether you're a sixth grade uh, elementary school student or you're, you've got a master's degree in finance. So Khan Academy, I really recommend, especially if you've got kids, you've got to be on Khan Academy. But he's also got explanations of internal rates of return, discounted cash flows, things you don't need to know anything about. But things which become important as you begin to value real estate and, and begin to acquire additional properties in the future. Right? Yes? So I lived in the neighborhood, I was only renting, and there was an Ingalls store. Right. They closed then. Okay. So do all the houses do 20% value? It, it depends on if there's not another grocery store in the area, absolutely. Well, it was a Kroger's and then like a Target. Superstore. Three, four right. miles. In Ingles was back out of the market. They weren't making enough margin. So you got the Kroger and the Super Target would pick up the slack from the lost Ingles. That's the reason the third store has, unless the store is within a mile, the third store has less value than the first two. Right? Make sense? How does this work for wholesalers only? Like, if you're not looking for rehab or anything like that, you're just a wholesaler and you want to just focus on wholesaling. Right. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be focusing on what creates, you're going to want to, I want you to learn what creates value, right? That's what I want you to pay attention to. We make money in the future. future. Do we care what comps are? No. no. It's just a good baseline, some place to get started. But all the people that aren't in the room, they're going to care about comps. Do you, so you've got a piece of paper uh, that we've handed out, uh, which by the way is, the, uh, I had uh, 75 copies of that made up, these, these three handouts. One of those is a uh, German discount grocer. Um, uh, uh, that was put the on that. Um. So you've got a handout from Lidl of this, from this year. They're the competitor to Aldi. They don't, those are two companies that don't like each other very much. Um, in the sense that they are really fierce competitors. So on the handout, you've got the address of where Lidl is going to be opening stores. Right? So you could go to that address on Google Earth, hit measure, right click, hit measure, draw a three mile circle around that intersection, right? Just draw, just draw a line that goes three miles, stop it right there, it marks it off, it's easy to do. Then go up and click uh, places, groceries, and see how many other grocery stores are close to where that store is. And you're going to be looking for something just on the outside of or just near where that ring is, right? As a place to go to look. And while you're driving there, you'll see something else. Because what I want you to begin to see is that we have to determine what we perceive the value to be in the future. What's our risk premium? You're wanting to get control of a property and you're wanting to sell it for a profit. Now, it is absolutely true that people will go out and they'll mail letters and they'll get leads and they'll get deals, right? And you can get that deal and you can assign that deal to somebody else and you can make $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 on those transactions. That absolutely does happen all the time, right? But I'm wanting you to understand how value is made in real estate for your lifetimes. We're going to get into that in just, yes? 
Right? Yes. So, you know, I, I love the strategy about the, you know, the grocery stores and things. You know, we're looking at, a, or we're buying a commercial property where less than a mile away on one side and, and you know, a little bit over a mile away, there's an $800 million redevelopment project. I just read about that. And, yeah. and then on the other side, there's a hundred million. And, and I never even looked at, yeah, I knew that it was going to bring the value, but how you're articulating, you know, that is, uh, is profound. So those are the type of things that you would look at. Uh, absolutely. What you're looking for in that particular situation for your property is what does the road access look like for your property? Because those other developments are going to be creating lots of traffic, right? Yeah. So on your commercial property, um, de depending on its location on the street, whether it's got left turn access to get into it, how, how fast the traffic's moving in front of it. Just as a quick plug for you, um, what you've got to be careful about is you don't want a property that's going to be auctioning off the merchandise in the stores. In other words, the only reason people will stop in a 40 mile an hour street is if something's really cheap or it's a destination use. They're going to their accountant, they're going to their attorney. So you wind up, depending on where that your commercial property is, you get two busy anchors, developments, right? People going back and forth. Why are they going to stop at your place? Are you going to be renting to designated users where people will stop because they're going there? Or are they going to have something that they're going to be able to sell at a price that is so cheap people will stop? Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm off the site here, but um, I've done lots of commercial projects. Um, my, my son just uh, developed, uh, among his other projects, he just acquired land zone and uh, developed a Starbucks. So we understand, I mean, we're on the, we understand the commercial side of the real estate business. Does anybody understand this? I'm going to run out of time here. Um, yes, go ahead, sir. In that particular situation, obviously, overcrowding was a concern for Oh, yeah. We don't want those people in our neighborhood. We've got all we want right here. So would it make sense to look at the next person? Exactly. That's exactly what you did. You, you look at their, you use grassland as your ranking anchor, right? And you start comparing to the other neighborhoods. Because, as he said, Franklin's an extremely expensive area to get into. But it's the same everywhere, right? If you see people going out and putting up homeowner signs in a neighborhood that's never had homeowner signs before, whatever school district that is, is going to get better in two or three or four years. But it'll take two or three or four years for it to happen. It'd be a wonderful place to buy a rental property because the market is going to be moving up. Because those people are involved, right? They're setting up a homeowner association. They're going to be involved with the PTA. If you have an involved PTA, it's amazing how much better the school gets overall. The school gets more supplies, more, more things. Teachers feel better about teaching. Parents are more involved, right? So what you're looking for are the changes in the market which impact the future. So Franklin Planning and Zoning, you search for an agenda, it pulls up an agenda, and uh, it's got a particular item. You can read about the item. You can see who the, the experts in the business are, the attorney that's representing the engineering firms. If you want experts, right? And you'll get the name in most situations of the planning staff member who wrote the recommendation. You can call them up, get their name right off the website, call them up and ask them if they know if there's any uh, new grocery stores or Walmarts planned in the area. It's amazing how people like to talk to real people that aren't mad at them for something. <laughs> so I, uh, real quick, I did this newsletter for the RIA group back in 2014. That's a planned Kroger. So I did this in July 2014, I, the meeting that I had was in December of 13, talking about this Kroger. So I had it at the meeting, talking about this Kroger that was planned on, in the north side of uh, Knoxville, in a community called Powell. And that's the site plan, the restaurant pads that they had laid out in front of it. And so you could draw a map around where the Kroger, there's the Interstate 75, there's where the Kroger was going to go. You can draw a map that just by driving around, to your point exactly over here, you can draw a map and say, well, look how much easier it's going to be. I don't have to go under the interstate. I don't have to divide. I don't have to waste my time in traffic for the people that are going on and off the interstate, right? And that traffic disaster that's uh, the Emory Road intersection in Knoxville. This Kroger's on this side. So all of these houses have easier shopping and within three. So this was in 2014. The store did not open, okay? 
So this was planned, it was done, everything was in place. There were real estate agents in two, <laughs> I can't make this up. There were real estate agents uh, in October of 2016. The, the store was coming up out of the ground, right? It, so it's 18 months after this. Stores coming up out of the ground, real estate agents were, still did not know what was being built on that property. They've been listing property and selling property and advising people where to buy or not buy houses for two and a half years from the time that this was approved to the time it got started under construction. What, we have to, what you all have to be careful about is when do you put the property under contract? What are you buying for? Right? The store got delayed because they had some uh, uh, water issues with the creek that's on the property. So the store got delayed for a year dealing with permitting issues. So you need to understand and pay attention to what's going on, but I guarantee you, if you bought anything inside that uh, little box or little rectangle right there, you made a bunch of money that the Kroger's opened up. Now there's five restaurants in front of it. That whole side of the interstate's blown up. Everybody that bought something made money. Everybody who bought something that was renting for $1,000 is renting for thirteen or 1400 now. How to predict the future. This one. I'm already over time, but we're going to do this real quick. It's easier than you think, and to see how easy it is, uh, let's look at some recent past. And I like to do this because I, I really like to talk about when I'm right. Um, it's so hard to talk about when I'm wrong. Uh, 2012, um, my predictions in January, this was after the election. This was the uh, uh, November meeting of 2011, my prediction for 12. Uh, uh, President Obama just won re-election, re investing after the election. Bad for fossil fuels, big business and small medicine. Good for public education, clean anything in existing social services. And so we knew from all the things that were said in the campaign, this was the Obama agenda. Well, if you're in Knoxville, Tennessee, 40 miles to the northeast is coal country. So what's good, what's good, is 20 miles from Knoxville. It includes Lenore City, Oak Ridge, and Maryville. And you can, again, you can just look at what's going on around the city of Knoxville. You can look at any community. Look at a community that's got a hospital that's going to close, like the, they did up in coal country, or you look at a hospital that's going to add a $100 million expansion. Where do you want to go? There you go. If you're looking at something in 2012 and the main industry in the town was coal, why would you buy that property? Right? So they, they told us, I'm not smart, I just pay attention. All I do is pay attention. My only skill. <laughs> Ignore it. So it mildly for 2016. Trump gets elected. <laughs> um, ignore the election, the Fed, because everybody was worried about raising rates. Everybody was worried about oil in 2016. And don't worry about the Far East. We have, in 2016, we had quickly decreasing inventory of housing. Decreases, massive decreases in foreclosures and REO offerings. A decrease, the MLS began to decline significantly. Uh, limited and expensive new construction. Harder to get things zoned, and they had passed new building codes throughout the South. So most of the cities were adopting new building codes, which added somewhere between 5 and 10 percent to the cost of all new construction. So if we're remodeling and we know all new construction is going to be 10 percent more expensive, do we really care what the house sold for in the past? Because we're going to be remodeling into the future, right? So if we know what the new house, if we spend our Sundays going to open houses and visiting new construction to see what they're doing and to see what they look like, right? We know the kind of finishes that they're going to see in new houses. Why don't we just do something really nice? We can raise our profit margin by 5 or 10 percent and still be in line with the new construction because building codes changed, right? We're still going to have to meet, the remodelers are still going to have to meet the codes, still going to do things right, but we're not building an all-new house. So the impact on the remodeled houses is significantly less than on new construction. And they just had a new building codes going to the 2000, most cities have adopted the 2018 codes now. So we have increasing prices for per square foot, investors competing with home occupiers. So we got into a situation in 2016 
we were coming into 2000, this was the outlook for 2016. In 2015, I called it the year of the investor because it was hard to do anything wrong in 2015. You could still make some mistakes, but it was really hard to do anything wrong in 2015. 2016, investors are competing with the home occupiers. Buyers are having trouble getting houses bought because they've shown up with a qualified home mortgage, right? But the investors are showing up with cash and buying the houses up. And it got to be where that was the beginning of the real competition on the houses under $300,000 in what I call under the FHA lending limits. Listing prices to sales prices became very, are going to become very problematic. This was all predictions in 2016. So nobody knows exactly what things are going to be worth as we're moving forward in the year. So the rest of the predictions for 16. So this is three years ago. This gets to be important in a minute. Rentals and flips should dominate the overall market for the next two years. These are my predictions. And again, don't take anything I say as a statement of fact. Don't have any confidence in what I'm doing. You gotta go home and make the effort to prove me wrong. Spend the time to do the research on the information I'm giving and sharing with you. Make the effort to prove me wrong. But my predictions in 2016, it will be a shelter crisis, not a housing crisis. For, the two, for 2016 and, set, and likely 17 and 18, and it's getting worse. From, and the reason that I could say that was easy because from 2010, at the, near the bottom of the recession, to 2015, home ownership declined from 69% of the population to 64%. How many million more people were renters in the United States? Five million. There, the, the population of home buyers is down to like 63, 62% right now. I predicted that it's going to get to 59% of the population before 2025. Why? We got a whole generation of people that grew up in 2000, um, they were teenagers. 15% of all the housing in the United States was either foreclosed on or in pre foreclosure in 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. 22% uh, in 2009. These are teenagers that saw their families lose their house. They uh, saw their, the, the value of their the family's wealth go away. The family's been in construction. They don't want to own houses. They're, they're coming into the home buying age right now, right? They're in their uh, mid to late 20s, early 30s. They don't want to buy a house. They want to rent something that's nice. They want to be able to have somebody else fix the problems. They want to move on. That's the so that's the problem that the government's dealing with, is to how to encourage people to buy more housing. I can get into the whole thing about housing and job creation and everything else about it, but what you want to talk about is 2019, my prediction, the year of living dangerously. In 2019, this year has been, we could see what the market was doing, but it was hard for anybody to understand where we could price the property, how aggressively could we price the property, because nobody knew how the appraisers were going to keep up. And people were flipping contracts and assigning contracts because they were getting something under contract. And there were plenty of buyers because the MLS inventory has continued to decline. The agents have got plenty of people that are wanting to buy houses. And so the remodelers are desperate to find something that they can remodel and fix up for some price, right? So there's all kinds of remodelers who are running around everywhere in the United States, not just Knoxville and Atlanta, but everywhere, looking for things to buy that they could fix up. So wholesalers, to your point, all you had to do was have remodelers who were out there, right? I'm, I'm, I'm over time, Stacy. This is good. Yeah. Keep going. 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 So, um, getting started, there's, an, they're on, there's a newspaper somewhere in Atlanta that lists all the foreclosures uh, for free. It lists all the homes that are being foreclosed on, right? And uh, in most of the, in today, they used to be real long, but most of the time now, the people that are listing the foreclosures in bold print have the uh, address of the property and the zip code Right? And they've got the condition whether there's tenants in it, if there's other liens against it. So you can learn to read the foreclosure listings. But what you want to do, because it's public record, is to drive to some of those, see what they look like, right? Spend your time driving to those neighborhoods where the foreclosures are occurring, 
You've had a definite reason. You're going to get a pre-foreclosure You're going to buy a pre-foreclosure list. Use it the right way. You go, you know, I don't, I'm saying don't do that, but if you did do that, use it the right way. We don't mail the stuff out there to them. You drive some of the houses, you look at what's going on in the neighborhood, you look at the house. You go buy the house, you know, follow the house over 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. You click on the public records, the register of deeds in Atlanta has got a register of deeds. The property sold to somebody, right? Most likely it's sold to an investor. You drive back to the house, so you're tracking that house, you're tracking, it's easy to track eight or 10 houses, you spend some time driving, you put the kids in the car, you drive around, buy them ice cream, look at houses, right? You're looking at pre-foreclosures. You're wanting to see what other houses in the neighborhood are selling for. You're wanting to develop a mental, Stacy said it right, a mental database, right? Of what particular neighborhoods look like. And so, when you're doing that, and you're looking at the pre-foreclosures, and it does get foreclosed on, it's going to sell, and it either sold to the bank, Right? Which means that investors didn't want it, or it's sold to an investor. And you want him to be doing it, you know, you want to be tracking it all the properties about every 30 days, you know, every two weeks, every 30 days, no later than every 30 days. Because when it sells to the investor, they're going to start remodeling the house. And it will have sold to an LLC, most likely. You drive to that house that you've already seen, and you've been tracking for the previous 90 days. And you know what you're going to find when you go there? A construction crew mm -hmm. and that construction crew has got uh, subcontractors in it who are working to fix the house and you're not gonna believe this but they'll tell you what they're gonna be doing to that house mm -hmm. and you tell them you know I almost I, I started to buy this house and I didn't buy it which is a true statement there's a lot of things that are said on YouTube that are an absolute lie Sean Terry has a thing about putting up a sign, you see a vacant house and you, try to, you can't find the owner and you try to skip trace and you spend all this money, put a sign up in the yard, uh, house for three bedroom, two bath house for sale, put your phone number on that sign and wait for people to call you. <laughs> now in Tennessee, that'll get you into a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble, right? This is real estate. You do not need to lie, steal, or cheat to make a wonderful living your entire life. The truth is unbelievably easy. So when you go to, you've been following these houses, you're telling the truth. I looked at that house. I thought about buying the house. I'm interested in what you guys are doing for, as a remodel. I'm a beginning investor. If the crew is Hispanic, you might need to take the Hispanic part of the um, South Atlanta Rio with you to help translate, <laughs> right? But they'll tell you who the buyer of the property, who their boss is, right? They'll hand you one of their cards and say, if you, need, if you need any work, here's our card, please call us. And you can see the quality of the work they're doing right there. That's how you find buyers, right? Don't waste your time sending out mailers and you know, handing out business cards. And, uh, it's good to get names and everything in auctions, right? But those guys that go into auctions, they're all real. If they're going to the courthouse steps, they got hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash on them and cashier's checks and they don't want to be bothered by anybody. They're going to be serious about buying something. Just pay attention to what they bought. See how many people bid on the house, right? Then go to the house. I was curious to know your philosophy on uh, driving for dollars just randomly. I never really bought into that philosophy. And I'm hearing what you're saying about the list and following up with the list to the property. I, I never, I drive for dollars all the time. I never drive anywhere unless I've got a specific reason to go there. So just like, I was saying, I'm driving somewhere because I want to see what that neighborhood looks like. I want to see that particular house, right? right. I'm driving there because I want to, it's something, an area that I don't know about. It's an area that I want to learn more about. And while I'm driving over there, I'm just paying attention to what's going on around me. Maybe I will see, I've, I've got a specific reason that I'm going to go, and I charge myself. I got an app, um, that, uh, I, an hours tracker, and you can put in there different job descriptions and everything, and it tracks your time. And I charge myself, uh, $30 an hour to drive for dollars just so I know how much time I'm spending driving for dollars just as a token amount if I'm if I'm in negotiations I charge myself $200 an hour right uh, so it's just something to, for me whether I'm worth that or not worth that or worth more or less it gives me a number right that makes me if I was an uber driver and I make it $30 an hour I'm driving across town right so you got to think in terms of what is your time worth? 
why are you doing something specifically and how will you use that information to make you money? If you drive to a house that's a pre-foreclosure, you're wanting to look at that house, but you're also wanting to look at the neighborhood. And then you're gonna, when you're driving up on the house after you've done this for eight or 10, 12 weeks, four months, because I don't want you to be in a, think in terms of making money, it, it happens, but don't think in terms of making a great big bunch of money in a hurry, think in terms of making a six month or seven month commitment to education of learning the market reading the paper, what's going on, understand where the market's going. Now, so 2019, best of times, worst of times. The reason that this was December of last year, or November of last year. Ah, I'm sorry, this was January. And this, right. so this was January this year. Uh, it may be the best of times or maybe the worst of times because we don't know which way. We know where the market's going. We know how it's getting there. We just got to be careful of making mistakes while we're getting there. It was the investors who could easily overstep, over remodel a house, spend too much money. They think they're going to get ahead of the market and the appraisals don't take keep up. But what happened is we were taking action. And that's what I'm telling everybody that's in the room tonight. All the YouTube videos, Sean Terry, Max Maxwell, we're going to get to Max in a minute. These are all about taking action, doing something, right? Not sitting back and doing nothing. It's about doing something with a certain purpose, which is going to improve your market knowledge so you can make a better decision tomorrow on putting a property under contract, right? So the government shutdown, there were eight, last year, there were 800,000 people who were unemployed and worked for the federal government. 800,000 people. 725,000, these are government employees in Washington, D.C. Right? These are good jobs. These aren't just average jobs, right? They did a poll of the people who were unemployed temporarily. 725,000 of them replied back that they did not have enough cash or credit to pay 30 days worth of bills. This is 800,000 well-paid people. And not enough, not enough to pay 30 days worth of bills. We're in a retirement crisis. 60%, 60% of the people that are 65 today don't have $1,000. Why do you think that is? Because they, they, they haven't saved the money, they haven't bought any real estate, they haven't invested in the stock market, they haven't lived with less so that they, they can accumulate more. Dave Ramsey talks about uh, all the time about managing your money, managing debt. I, I'm not a Dave Ramsey fan because I, I believe in debt and leverage and taking risks. Right. Dave Ramsey is a philosophy of not take risks, right? Pay out of debt, and then once you get everything paid out of debt, then maybe you can afford to take some risk. I, I'm willing to spend some time to gain some market knowledge, and then I'm going to bet red or black, red or black, red or black. I think that wheel's going to be red. Boom! I'll take that chance, right? And they're going to open up a new grocery store. I'm going to go near where that grocery store is going to be built. I'm going to buy something, right? Because I know when that store opens, I've made money on my property. Okay? But should we um, pay the debts off that can't be removed by bankruptcy and things like that? Should those debts be? I, I'm, I'm a real believer in paying off all the debts you can possibly pay off. If you've incurred the debt, everybody needs to pay the debt, right? So. Um, that's another whole conversation. Uh, so what will happen in 2020? That's what I'm actually supposed to have talked about 20 minutes ago. So, uh, again, it will be the best of times and it will be the worst of times. And we have to look at what's going on in inflation. There is no inflation. They can't make inflation. They're talking about the Federal Reserve doing negative interest rates. Uh, so banks will loan money at lower interest rates. There is no inflation. So real estate is the best opportunity for anybody to get a rate of return on their money. The life insurance companies who, you know, 10 years ago were selling life insurance policies with a 7% and 8% accumulated dividend, they haven't made 7 or 8% on anything other than real estate in the last 10 years. There's trillions of dollars in cash I'm just sitting on the sidelines right now looking for a place to go. So there are more people, there's increasing regulation, 
Regulation makes us money because we understand it. Prices go up. There is less land and therefore less new construction. The new construction that does go on is considerably more expensive than it was 36 months ago. Right? Materials and labor are more expensive. So we wind up with a situation that we know that the demand is going to be there, but value is demand plus financing, which is another reason that comps are really dangerous. Does it make any difference how much demand you have that you want something if you don't have any money? If you can't borrow any money, does it make any difference how much a homeowner wants to buy a house if they can't borrow the money? Right? Without financing, there is no housing. Step back for just a second. The entire housing industry was created in 1936 to create a jobs program for people who were out of work. Housing is a six-month construction program for about with all the things that are now involved in housing for between 15 and 20 percent of the population of the country are involved in the real estate industry in some way. But in 1936, they, tried to, they needed to encourage people to buy homes, and the federal government decided to start lending money so that people would buy homes. And if you really want to have some fun, go to your public, research on your public library website, the newspapers from 1936 when they were debating whether the government should begin loaning money to people. That's a really interesting, you won't believe the conversations that people have. But the whole thing is based on there has to be money available because demand without money, nothing gets built, right? Builders are not speculators in the sense that they're going to speculate and hope somebody buys their home. They're going to build a home because they know that there are people out there that want to buy their home and there's going to be money available six months from now. Builders are looking at inventories six to nine months in the future. That's all they look for, right? So whether it's Toll Brothers or Pulte or Ryan Homes or any of the big builders, they've just got a lot of inventory that's going to keep them busy for six to nine months. So, so let's look at this. Uh, this is Knoxville. There's one of these available for land. I'll show it you in a second. What were the FHA lending limits? What, are, what FHA loan? So the FHA, uh, Federal Housing Authority, is the loan for the people that are getting, you know, what would be called starter homes. And there's, a, there's FHA, USDA, Department of Agriculture, there's rural loans, uh, and then there's every state's got a development loan that it does, right? And those group of loans comprise about, depending on the, the time of the market, somewhere between uh, 10 and 25% if you're in bigger markets, it's 5 to 10 percent. If you're in smaller markets, it's 25, 30 percent of the total sales of the marketplace. Cash buyers in Knoxville for the last three years, cash buyers have been 20 to 25 percent of the market every single month, consistently every month for the last 36 months. Uh, the FHA, USDA, that group of home loans that you can get into, USDA is, a, I think it's 104 percent of the mortgage, of the purchase price of the home. FHA, you're getting in with three and a half percent down. So a hundred thousand dollar house, you get you get in for thirty five hundred dollars, and your mama can give you the money. If it's a conforming loan, you need you need five percent down, right? So you, you can get a. In 2014, they changed the lending standards back. I believe it was on FHA loans. They raised the criteria, and then they began to drop it back in 2014, 15, 18, 19. This is, some, this is free. This is a comprehensive housing data. And uh, it's got a market area. And it goes into detail about what the government is forecasting for the housing and urban development to plan for affordable housing in a community, what the housing stock is and what it looks like it's going to be for the next two years. These are generally updated every two years. So you can read in here where it talks about, and, uh, this is Knoxville, I was pointing out, uh, during the 12 months recently ending, uh, non-farm payrolls increased by 7,002%. Non-farm payrolls. So we've got an increasing job market in Knoxville. It goes on to talk about how the median price was $172,000. 
and it's increased 7% in one year. Now this is free public information, right? And it's telling you right there that everything in housing is about to go up. If it went up 7%, we've got more jobs being created, there's, there's thousands of housing units short, right? It's thousands, right over here is a little chart, how many thousand, 3,500 units short of what they need. The only place the pricing can go up is up because what happens is they raise the limits. So here it is for Atlanta. The Atlanta metropolitan areas focus on Fulton County, the uh, comprehensive market uh, study. Let's see what's, up, actually, what's it called so you get them. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, it's the um, comprehensive housing market analysis. It's free. So in 2014, the FHA lending limit was $271,000. It had been $271,000 for about seven years. It raised, uh, it, went, it increased just a token amount to $275,655, just a token of a few thousand dollars. But let's look at what happens in 2018. It goes up to $294,000. I think, in quick math, that's about $19,000 difference. So one day, let's just call it 20000 for simple math. One day, the house is going to sell for $275,000. Let's say two hundred, dollars just to be simple math. $200,000. And the next day, the FHA lending limit is increased by $20,000. What does an investor do when that happens? Raise the price of the house because it's happening in the future. So if we know today that FHA is going to raise the lending limits, and we've got an idea as to how much they're going to raise the lending limits, do we really care what the comp say it was worth 60 days ago or 90 days ago? Because now we've got a whole new pool of buyers out here that have been wanting to buy. The limits have been raised, and it's still just 3.5% down. So an increase of $20,000 is just $700, right? The buyer only has to have $700 more money in cash and the ability to pay about $10 a month more money in mortgage payments, right? And the investor picked up $20,000. You want to wholesale a deal? Know what the FHA lending limits are and know when they're going to go up because what somebody's looking to buy for today, I'll guarantee you 99%, I don't say 99, I'll say 90% for sure, with certainty, 90% of rebuilders do not know what the FHA lending limits are and most realtors do not know. So what happened is in 2014, 15, 17, 18, 19, we went from $271,000 to $314,000. An increase of $43,700. Knoxville is not Nashville, it's not Atlanta. We don't have the really wealthy people. That thousands of people moving there with jobs to pay seventy dollars to $100,000 a year. We don't have thousands of people like Atlanta and Nashville where people make a quarter million a year, right? So what do you think? So 2014, it was $172,000. What do you think the... Um, increase in value in Knoxville, Tennessee is in houses. $43,000. That's so we're about $215,000 meeting sales price today. The entire increase of value was created by the increase of FHA lending limits. We can talk all we want about how smart we are, what kind of systems we've got, how good we are at marketing, how good we are at finding the information, but most of the people are making money by accident. The government is guaranteeing that there's a bigger pool of buyers than there was before the rates went up. So in Knoxville, if you bought a house for $172,000, it's gone up to $215,000 just for no other reason other than the government's increased the FHA lending limit. This is really important stuff for you all to understand about making money in real estate right here. There is no there is no value without financing. There can be all kinds of demand, but if the end buyer cannot buy a home, there is no value. And as, as was proven in 2008, 9, and 10, 
When nobody knows what something's worth, nobody's buying it. Right? So, the conforming lending limit was increased uh, by $67,000. And so probably in the national market, if I was guessing, you're probably in the, the increase, is, the median increase is about $60,000, if I was guessing. In national, it is $60,000, increase in value. Median sales price between 14 and then the conforming lending limit. So January 2020, it's already been announced that the conforming limit is going to go to $510,000. So that's $16,000, $26,000 increase in conforming lending limits. So houses above the FHA lending limit are going to go up. So if you've got an FHA, if, if you're in an FHA house now, you've been in an FHA house for some number of years, or you're in a lower priced house and you want to move into a bigger priced house, the government's making it possible in hot markets to buy a house. It's going to give you $26,000 more money to buy a house than what you had December 31st. When will those sales start to show up in January? March, April, right? Second quarter. But we know now that it's going to be wrecked. I mean, that's, you can Google that. That's that's fact, right? My mortgage broker, I mean, I confirmed with him. He's what called told me. Um, so we know for a fact that's going to happen. So we don't know what FHA is going to raise theirs to, but they're going to follow. So I'm guessing FHA is going to be in that 329 range, another $15,000. That is money laying on the ground just asking for it because we know what people can get loans for. It costs, yes. So this puts us in a position ahead of of everybody, if you're paying attention. <laughs> Which is phenomenal. So we can, I mean, we all live here. And I used to live in Nashville as well, old Hickory. But uh, <laughs> if, 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 we, if we focus on Fulton and DCAB with this information, if we're paying attention. It, it would be hard, if you can get a transaction and contract, it'd be hard not to find somebody that would pay you a real profit to get it. Right. right? And what you have to have are people that want to sell. You don't really care, as I would say, man, I'm, I'm gonna buy a house, I'm in a house, the people got kids, things are going bad for the family, they're gonna lose the house. You know, I've got a, figured out a construction crew ready to start, I got the money at, at escrow already. I'm, I'm just making a walkthrough to make sure that I, I understand everything that's going on because I wanna be sure that we're not going to jam the homeowner up because they're losing the house, right? They need another thousand or fifteen. They, they got so people get into bad situations. Things happen. People, there are people who deserve and create the problems for themselves. They deserve what happens to them, right? Just to be fair, like the way life works. But you know, so many other people that life just happens, and they get in a bad situation. So we have a chance for a lessening of profit. So we go from $15,000 profit to $14,000 and give those people $1,000 to, to be able to move and buy groceries wherever they get to where they're going. Is that, we have a lessening of profits, you know? We're not giving them half the money. We're giving them something. We're helping them feel good about moving forward. We don't need to take advantage of them. We don't need to try to buy the house for a thousand less. How much money do we need to make, right? Point of reference on money, 1780, a million, 1770. A million dollars was a real marker of wealth in the United States. If you had a million dollars, you were really wealthy. You know what? In 2019, they still use a million dollars as a marker. So if people who got a million dollars are still considered to be wealthy, right? Wow, that's great. So, uh, but 1780, a million was still the mark. So does all this make sense? Yes. Now, we'll see if we got an interstate connection. And uh, everybody didn't know who Max Maxwell is? Yes, I'm watching all Max that. Maxwell has got 157,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. Yes. He started in uh, uh, June, May, June, on his, by what he said, of 2016. You remember what I called 2016? The year of the investor. There's no way to make a mistake in 2016. No way. Right? So I'm, 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 in 2015 and 2016, I'm telling people, 
this is what's going to happen because the government's giving me the damn information. Right? They're telling me what they're going to loan money on. It's not like I'm some kind of rocket scientist. Right? right? So, we'll see if I can get this to play. It, the video is, uh, in case I can't get it to play, wholesaling real estate, cold call coaching. But this is, um, a bit, so Mac, this guy's brilliant. I mean, he's really a smart guy. Um, so, just like with Sean Terry, I'm not wanting to be negative to Sean Terry. I'm wanting to be, point out the differences with what I think and what Sean teaches. And this guy's got all these viewers, I don't have any. Uh, Maxwell is the same. So again, it's not that I want to be negative. I want you all to see what you need to learn that's different, I believe, than what's being taught. Well, who has the higher net worth? Yeah. I, I have no idea. <laughs> So we'll see if this plays. No, I gotta go in play. Yeah, of course. 
I'm interested in buying real estate. I'm interested in working with people who have real estate, right? I'm interested in going to um, uh, one of those trout farms where there's trout right there and all I got to do is put it in and I'm going to catch something, right? I'm, I'm interested in fishing where I know there's something that I'm going to want to do. You heard the conversation. Max is listening to his guy. They're having uh, the following up on uh, a lead with their contact management system. They've called somebody back. We heard about that earlier, right? Following up on leads that you have. And the guy says uh, he wants 25000 Max is just saying he's throwing the number out from nowhere. But after you listen to the conversation, that guy knows why he's wanting $25,000, right? He didn't want to, he's, and we also know he's done the work himself because he said, I did, right? He did that work himself. But what did he say that was the key part of the conversation? It's the smallest and cheapest of my properties. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's the obvious question? It could have been asked way back, could have been asked at the five minute mark. What's, what's the question that you need to be able to ask? The conversation's about to go in an entirely different direction right now. The question is, how many other properties do you own? If the guy says 20, right? This is somebody who's serious and tired. Otherwise, he wouldn't be selling this little house. Maybe he owns 25. Maybe he owns two. If he owns two, you go to buy all three. Look, I'd like to buy, I'm really interested in this house, but maybe sometimes it's easier to buy more than less. Would you be interested in selling your other two houses? And just like that, you're dealing with somebody who has money. He may not need all the money he's going to get from the sale. He's done the work to the houses. The other two houses are rented for sure. You're buying houses with tenants in them. The question never gets asked. How many other houses do you own? How did you, when did you start asking personal questions? When did you start buying houses? Why did you start? How did you get your first house bought? Have you owned this house uh, since 1952? There's no part of the conversation that is building. Stacy talks about it. Uh, you, I don't ever want to be in a situation where I'm mimicking or copying somebody, right? To, if I went to, if they went to UT and I and I went to Clemson, I don't want to talk about I went to UT, right? Um, if they if they went to the University of Georgia, I, said, I definitely wouldn't say I went to the University of Georgia. Both ends. <laughs> but the, the the thought process here is you've got to listen to what strangers say. You've been paying attention. There's a new grocery store going to be built. There's a new school going to be built. Uh, they're going to remodel this high school to close that high school. You don't want to go over there. You want to go over here. So you're, once you go, you're being curious about the things you're paying attention to. You see a property and you ask strangers about the house. You're talking to the owner of the house. You're talking to a neighbor about a house you're interested in buying. You're asking strangers questions and you listen to what they say. And it's great that Max Maxwell's doing these videos. He's got all these great videos. He's got videos of him buying houses. He's got a photographer who drives around with him now just videoing him all day long every day uh, and edits the video and posts it on uh, YouTube. I mean, the guy's just, he, he's a brilliant, brilliant um, marketer, no question about it. But the issue gets to be, you have good days and you have bad days. Thomas Magnuson, that's Thomas Magnuson, one of the great nature photographers in the world. Uh, and if you are fishing during spawning season, there's no way not to catch fish. If everything is coming at you and running past you, there's no way not to make money. Right? How much has the market moved up because the government is letting people with 3.5% down continue to buy homes? Right? 
Well, we know it's gone up $43,000. We think it's going to go up another $15,000. We know that conforming loans have gone up $90,000 by January the 1st of next year. We are, we are the people who can shape our own destiny by taking action. What Maxwell talks about, what Sean Terry talks about, is people who take action. But what I talk about is understanding why you're taking the action. You've only got so much time and you've only got so much money. You need to be spending your time and spending your money where you can get a return on your money and you can lower your risk of failure. That's what I'm talking about. Does it make sense? Yes. yes. So with that, you've got to project, project. I promised Stacy that I would give a projection for 2020 and that's my projection for 2020. It's going to be a real good year to be a real estate investor. You just have to be real careful about how, why you're pricing the properties, where you're pricing them, because the market's going to continue to move.